there's a difference. There's a big difference between a bunch of guys promoting a crypto project because they want to get rich and a diverse group of professionals and academics spread across the globe trying to push the science of crypto forward in hopes of changing the world. The difference in intent is obvious, but it's also accompanied by a difference in depth and scope. The first group is going to focus on whatever the market wants most and most immediately to maximize short-term remuneration, while the second group is going to focus on everything and anything that might maximize long-term impact. One of those two plans unleashes a lot more arrows. Ready? Let's go! Today, we're going to discuss the Cardano ecosystem deploying its arrows in a multitude of arenas. In the real world, with details from the World Mobile AMA, in the virtual world with news related to Cardano Island and Pavia, and even in the proof-of-work world. If your thoughts towards archery mainly revolve around how much better your debit card is at procuring food than any arrow, or if your freezer is full of elk felled by your own bow, please consider delegating to the Army of Spies Stake Pool Ticker AOS. One of the things that we don't really ever acknowledge is that Cardano and IOHK are very confusing to the rest of the crypto space. And that's because if you take out Satoshi and anybody involved with the cypherpunk movement and the early Bitcoiners, you're not really left with any kind of list you can make of people in crypto who aren't in crypto purely to make money. Sure, we all embrace kind of the the ethos of economic freedom and creating more equality through an alternative to the fiat legacy finance system. But most people are really in crypto for the money. And that puts them in this, this group that is always going to respond to what the market wants, what the market's going to want next, what the market most wants most immediately. It's not, and there's a lot of, there's a lot of um, mouth service to the, uh, to the long-term, you know, equality crypto ethos thing. But really what pro what people creating projects in crypto tend to deliver is whatever they think the market wants next whatever they're going to most want most quickly that's what they're going to deliver cardano and iohk tend to give you the exact opposite of that they're like oh oh you want imperative programming cool we're going to give you functional programming you want you want ponzi schemes masquerading as DeFi, and you want that next month cool we're going to give you real fi and it's going to take years it's not that they don't listen to what the market wants. They do. It's that they're not trying to make the most amount of money on the shortest timeline. They're trying to have the biggest impact on the longest timeline. So they don't give you imperative programming for your smart contracts, which would allow them to onboard a lot more developers a lot faster. They give you functional programming for smart contracts, because they think that'll result in more verifiable and more secure smart contracts over the long run. They're not trying to grow another robbery forest. They also know that all of these various types of Ponzi schemes wearing the robes of decentralized finance would also probably onboard a lot more users. There are a huge number of people a lot of DGENs of these types of projects who would love it if Cardano would just launch a plethora of these Ponzi schemes. And of course, they wouldn't be called Ponzi schemes. They'd be called DeFi platforms. But at the end of the day, they, they end up looking like Ponzi schemes. 
So Cardano doesn't promote those types of projects. They'll certainly exist in Cardano too, but that's not what Cardano promotes. IOHK and Cardano promote RealFi, which they think is going to have a real lasting impact for real human beings and make some kind of progress towards a more equal economic playing field for everybody on the globe. This is also why we see things like this. It is not a thing for Bitcoin maximalists to reach out to the proof of stake world and say, hey, uh, proof of stake blockchains, I really favor proof of work and Bitcoin, but I noticed you have this technical problem in proof of stake. So I just wanted to commission you know, a bunch of academic work to help solve that problem. You don't see Bitcoin maximalists doing that kind of thing, but you do see IOHK doing the opposite. You see IOHK here reaching out to the proof of work world and saying, hey, by the way, we're going to publish this new paper, which we think might help to minimize the energy cost and carbon footprint of proof of work blockchains like the Bitcoin blockchain. They say substituting the proof of work primitive in Nakamoto's longest chain protocol with a proof of useful work has been long theorized as an ideal solution in many respects, but to this day, the concept still lacks a convincingly secure realization. So we're pleased to announce that IOG research paper, Ophelimos Combinatorial Optimization via Proof of Useful Work, a provably secure blockchain protocol, has been accepted to crypto 2022. So why is IOHK sponsoring this research to fix the Achilles heel of Bitcoin? The Bitcoin maximalists hate us. They seem to hate the Cardano ecosystem above all. We're like their, their, their most hated competitor, even though I, I would argue that a lot of people in the Cardano ecosystem don't really look at Bitcoin as a competitor. Definitely the Bitcoin maximalists hate us. So why would IOHK go about sponsoring research which would attempt to push forward the science to fix the biggest argument against Bitcoin? It's because they're not interested in their own short-term self-interest. They're not going to do the thing that would, you know, create the most advantage for the technologies they've developed in the short term they're going to try to do whatever has the most lasting impact over the long term. They're going to launch a thousand different arrows. If there's a thousand different things they think might might have a big impact over the long term, they're going to fire off all those arrows, even if they're related to something like Bitcoin. If they think it's going to have a big lasting long-term impact, or maybe even just that it could, they're going to fire off that arrow too. Speaking of shooting for a lasting impact, we recently got a good AMA from Charles and World Mobile. So Charles pointed out that in order to have RealFi, the people who would most benefit from RealFi first need connectivity and digital identity. The connectivity part is where World Mobile comes in. And at some point in the AMA, somebody asked the qu a question about World Mobile's goal of connecting a billion people who currently aren't connected today. And Charles made a really good point about this. He reminded everybody that it took Pokemon Go 19 days to achieve 50 million users, which in and of itself is pretty amazing. But it's even crazier when you think about what he pointed out next, and that's that it took 68 years for 50 million people to fly in human history. From the beginning of human flight to 50 million people flying took 68 years. To get 50 million people on Pokemon Go took 19 days. Of course, the difference there is delivery mechanism. It was really hard to build enough and big enough planes for 50 million people to have flown from the early days of the Wright brothers to that point where 50 million people had flown, you had to build a lot of airplanes and building airplanes is not easy, but it was negligible marginal effort to onboard additional people to Pokemon Go. 
the delivery mechanism was so much better than that of flight in human history that you could do it in 19 days where it took 68 years in, in terms of getting that many people to fly. And this is important for what World Mobile is doing. So Mickey at one point mentioned they've seen up to 10,000 people on the network simultaneously. The World Mobile network, as it currently stands, they've actually seen 10,000 people using the network on a day, but they're not really focused on that number. They're focused on getting the sharing economy working properly so that they have an efficient delivery mechanism of this product. On any given day, they might have 2,000, 3,000, or even up to that very high number of 10,000 people using the network, but they don't really care about that. They could easily deploy enough equipment to onboard even more people to the current world mobile network, but that's not really the smart thing to do. The smart thing to do is to make sure the sharing economy is working correctly, make sure the incentives are good so that people want to want to become nodes in the network. They want to put those antennas up on top of their house. They want to build out the network for World Mobile. That's going to become the good delivery mechanism. Um, on the call, it was pointed out that it might take between, between two and 10 years to build out a a network like this, the traditional way, where you go around to people who own different buildings and you negotiate leases to put antennas up on top of their house. But through the sharing economy, there and the use of Cardano, they're trying to create the right incentives with the right delivery mechanism of those incentives to for people to build out the network themselves, which can happen a lot faster than this traditional method that might take between two and 10 years. Some of the most interesting news to come out of World Mobile very recently is that they're actually going to move into North America. Not that they're moving like their offices to North America, they're actually going to start providing service in North America, which was a little bit unexpected because we're used to associating World Mobile with Africa and providing connectivity to the unconnected. But Mickey actually pointed out that 10% of the U.S. population and 30% of the land mass of the U.S. isn't connected, which is a pretty high percentage. I mean, the U.S. is a very populous country, and 10% of a very populous country is a lot of people. He said they're going to start in Wyoming and move out from there, and there will be a B2B component as well as a B2C component. I also thought it was very interesting when they were talking about the cost of actually deploying the hardware that will help expand the network. They pointed out that uh, the the sort of smaller towers like we've seen erected in some of the uh, small communities in Africa can be quite inexpensive by sort of, you know, developed country standards. And it goes all the way from those very inexpensive hardware deployments like that all the way up to the gigantic aerostats, which might cost in the millions of dollars. From the real world to the virtual world, we also got some more information on Cardano Island. And this is kind of like a Cardano Island information blitz. It seems like there are AMAs going on every single day with Cardano Island. We keep learning more about what's actually going to happen. So if you're holding all seven Cardano Summit NFTs, you'll have access to the pre-mint. So this will start happening before mid-July. You'll also get access to special structures that will only be available to people who hold all seven of the Cardano Summit NFTs. They mentioned that there would be 9,999 parcels. And during the Q&A, a member of the public said that he had looked just the day before the AMA and he had counted something like 3,300 addresses with seven or more of the Cardano Summit NFTs in them. So things are looking pretty good. If you have all seven of the Cardano Summit NFTs and you want to pick up some of these Cardano Island parcels, I don't know how many you're going to be able to mint or allowed to mint, but it sounds like... Uh, if you're in that 3,300 and there are almost 10,000 parcels, the numbers are looking pretty good for you. They also mentioned the free bot mint again and elaborated on some more roles the bots might fill, including inventor, engineer, scout, explorer, mechanic, 
guardian, and scientist. They mentioned a scenario where some new thing is discovered somewhere in, I wasn't sure if it was going to be in Cardano Island or Virtua Prime, which is kind of like the larger world, which is going to connect all these different islands, including Cardano Island. So something may be discovered and only the people with, say, scout bots would be able to go and find those new things. So they were trying to, they were trying not to release too much information. I think they obviously have like an information release schedule and they were trying to sort of stick to that and not leak information too early. I think we're going to learn more kind of seems like it's been in sort of a constant drip so far, but if they're going to be releasing, if they're going to start this mint before mid July, I mean, we've only got a couple of weeks here for everyone to learn everything. They did say to remember that you'll need NAMI for the mint. I say this before every big metaverse mint, but I think it bears repeating because I actually mean it. I don't buy these as any kind of investment. I think of this as myself purchasing a game piece to use in a video game that I want to play. To me, this is sort of like a consumption of funds. This is not an investment. I, I, I buy these metaverse parcels assuming I will never see that money again, as if I'm buying a video game, as if I'm buying, you know, a game for the Xbox or something, I'm going to buy that game and I will never see that money again. And there won't be any reselling of that game. That's a way I think of these metaverse projects. I don't think of these as any kind of investment. I'm sort of buying these game pieces and kissing that money goodbye, because we don't know what's going to happen with these. We don't know if they're ever going to finish building these, if they're, you know, going to be cool, if, you know, they're going to achieve adoption, if the market for metaverse parcels might collapse, you know, either just in Cardano or across the entire crypto space. We don't know the answers to any of these questions. So when I buy these, I don't think of this as an investment. I think of this as a consumption of my funds and I kiss that money goodbye. One final very amusing note that's kind of a testament to the size and fervor of the Cardano ecosystem. Pavia says, order has been restored on Google for a while. A search for Pavia displayed pavia.io first. <laughs> so what, what they're saying here is that when anyone searched for Pavia, even if they were in Italy and they were trying to learn about the town of Pavia in Italy, what came up was information about pavia.io, the Cardano metaverse. I can imagine if you were some person in Pavia who has absolutely nothing to do with crypto, maybe you don't even know what crypto is, you certainly don't know what Cardano is or some metaverse in Cardano, you go to search the name of your hometown, the town you live in, and what you find is a bunch of information about a crypto metaverse. That's gotta be extremely demoralizing. Luckily, it looks like Pavia did the right thing. They said, we've worked with some others to rectify this. Now our domain is still number one organically, but now quite rightly, the Google knowledge graph displays this first, then us. I think this is the right result. Good on Pavia for <laughs> seeding their, uh, their, conceding their, their number one spot there to the actual town of Pavia, but pretty hilarious. The uh, Cardano ecosystem is so big, so strong that even our fake digital world called Pavia achieved a higher Google ranking than the actual real world town of Pavia. I hope you're having a great week and I will talk to you tomorrow.